My name is Dr. Nick. It is time for us to chit chat about some things. So, Bosch releases. Actually, who's ever made their own Bosch release? That's awesome. Um, who has uh, ever thought, wow, I wonder if this could have been faster because this took more than some mentally allocated amount of time I thought this should take? Cool. Um, and obviously, how long we think something takes is affected by something else we've seen. Um, if you've ever, from scratch, tried to figure out how to make Debian packages, I don't know how long that takes. Uh, by the way, if you ever do need to make Debian packages, there's a thing called FPM, and you should use that instead. Um, but if you've used Docker, and you've had the benefit of just copying and pasting other people's Docker crap and just into yours, it kind of works. And it somewhat sets an expectation of how fast everything else should be. Um, and making Bosch releases can be slower than that. So let's talk about how we can at least make it faster than you've previously experienced. Um, I do reference URLs to things because you know, the material I'd like to talk about does exist on the internet. Um, therefore, you might want to know, do I need to write down all the URLs? No, you don't. The slides are on the internet. You can get them later on. All right, um, to start with. So I, uh, when, when I wrote this book, uh, well, I call it a book even though it's just on the internet, but uh, you can like, get fake book covers and then you take it to a website and they put it on fake pictures so it looks like it's a real book. Um, and this, this, is, this I call her the DevOps girl, and she's, she's loving my book, and I think she's fantastic. Um, and uh, when I wrote it, this, the way in which I wrote this book was to, you know, it's very hard to think about how do you teach people Bosch. People talk about it's like there's a learning curve for Bosch. So the, the core idea of, on this book is just to skip the curve and just start on the sweet downhill ride of, of enjoying it. Um, so the book starts with everything's already working, and you've been put in the, the, this new job of, of living with this thing. And, um, and so we sort of talk about, you know, let's have a look what's running. Okay, there's Zookeeper, it's the processors, there's Monit, there's Bosch, there's the, you know, where the VMs came from, and you could have go out that way. And then, even though it says it's the ultimate guide to Bosch, it does seem to be missing, like, the entire section on well, how do I make my own Bosch releases. And, yeah, sure, that's missing, I don't care. And um, so this talk is, is somewhat in a um, uh, fill-in for that missing entire section of, of how you know, how I would write a Bosch release, not how you would do them. Because, I mean, I wrote my own tool six years ago called Bosch Gen, it helps me. That's not how the core team or anyone else than the Cloud Foundry group seems to write theirs. So, you know, my approach to it is different from theirs, uh, but you're all here to hear my approach, so screw them. Um, so, 10 ways. Uh, obviously, as you can imagine, I made up 10 when I was coming up with the talk title. It was accepted, and I thought, holy crap, I wonder if there are actually 10 ways. Um, 7, 9, 10, 15, any of these numbers are the ones I could have picked. Turns out there are 10 really good things. So uh, Docker containers, um, and then we're going to look at what is a basic empty Bosch release, because let's be honest, nothing's faster than a release that does nothing. Not practical, but fast. Um, we'll look at the Bosch tool, the Bosch gen tool I referred to, a uh, thing called create.yaml, or, or how to do version create, uh, just it's a faster way to iterate. Um, an approach to building Bosch releases by just worrying about packages first and not worrying about jobs. And you might think, well, how do I, how do I compile a package? I have to do a deploy. We'll get to it to hold your horses. Jeez. Um, what I call language packs, but other people call Bosch packages, um, which, as was brought up by anyone that went to the keynote today, the winner of the, uh, uh, the, the hackathon prize uh, was doing a central thing based around uh, uh, Bosch packages, language packs. Um, the fact that you can actually just use Debian packages, and if you've already got them, nothing faster than using something you've already got, and it's, I'm going to argue, perfectly valid to use them, and we'll go in what that looks like. Uh, moving on to writing the jobs. Uh, if you haven't already started using BPM, I highly encourage it, both because it's the future and because it makes it faster. And um, looking at, at how you're actually going to get your Bosch itself and how to do faster iteration if you're not using a variation of Bosch Lite and how to get that. And then um, perhaps less about being faster for you, but being faster for everyone else but you, which is sharing pre-compiled releases. All right, let's get into it. So nothing's faster about Bosch than not actually writing your own release. Like, a, an empty release is slower than not writing one at all. And uh, many people are already publishing Docker images. And if you've already got one, and perhaps, you know, and you could argue, OK, why not Kubernetes? Like, OK, why not Kubernetes? If you've got Kubernetes, use that. I don't need to argue. But if you want to just bring up VMs and you want to manage processes, but you've already got Docker images, you can just use like a Docker Bosch release and run things. And you're winning. 
Like, I mean, it's, what are we doing? We're running processes, we're exposing ports, we're storing things to disk, and we're talking to other machines. That's it, that's our profession. And there's security in there somewhere, I think. Um, backups and restores, you know, that sort of stuff. So don't take it all so seriously, and if you want to get, you know, get something up and running, just throw those Docker images as running processes, and, but you use Bosch for the VM lifecycle and the disk lifecycle. That's its, you know, what's its, what's, what does nothing else do as, as, like Bosch does? Manage the VM and disk lifecycle. Cool, let's do that. You could argue that the future of, of everything we do might just be Bosch runs Kubernetes, which runs everything else. That might be the future as we look back. Um, so anyway, this is an option. So there is, um, and again, the, if I, I made a little fake, but it's not a fake Bosch release. There's a little Bosch release that I built as I went along making these slides. You can look at this. One of the YAML files, there's two. Um, literally, it, it just runs uh, a job with the Docker Bosch release on it. There's a second job, a second sort of uh, job in that VM which says what Docker container to run. So two jobs, one runs Bosch, or one runs Docker Dame, and the other one tells it what to what to download and install. And um, and it works. Um, so the gist of it, obviously, it's always difficult to show Bosch YAML. Um, so there's bits missing here for the sake of making a bigger font. We want bigger fonts. We're all getting old. I like big fonts, um, but there are bits missing. But the gist of it is this. So we've got two jobs running on the VM, the Docker daemon, um, and, and all the configuration around what Docker is looking like, and then what containers to run. And, and there, whilst you could use the upstream Docker, you could write your own Docker image, Docker Bosch release if you want. I mean, by the way, that's, that's, that's certainly an approach, uh, one that I've used. Um, all right, step two, what is an empty Bosch release? Um, I mean, this, this really is more of a function of, of what makes Bosch create release not fail. Um, what it used to require more things, like it used to have to have an empty jobs folder, an empty packages folder. Now it doesn't complain about those things. But really, this is the, the core gist of it is, is a final.yaml with a name in it uh, and an empty blobs. And then if you run create release, it doesn't fail. You could upload it. You could include it in your performance. <laughs> don't do anything. <laughs> you literally can't really include it because you can't add to any instance groups because there's no jobs. Um, but you can have jobs, just to take this iteration, it's not the slides. You can have jobs that don't use packages. Right? You can have packages that aren't referenced by jobs. They won't be included in anything. They won't get compiled because there's nothing linking to them. Um, but this idea of, of an empty job is an interesting idea that we'll get to when we talk about creating packages first. The idea of an empty monet file that just references packages. All right, so an empty release. Kind of silly, but it gives us a starting point. The tool that I created in 2012 when I first saw Bosch um, was, was Bosch Gen. Um, Bosch CLI's always had a generator, and uh, I've always hated it. So that's my relationship with Bosch. Um, I like my generator a lot better. So uh, one of the things it does, in, in addition to creating a scaffold, is it also tries to set up your S3 bucket and make it public so you're ready to share. Uh, that's not on the slide, but that does that. Um, it, what it does generate works. So the moment you generate that project, you can deploy it. It's kind of like a pseudo empty project. There's a job, no packages, the job does nothing. Um, but the manifest includes that job and will deploy it. So the moment you've, you've got it, you go into the project, uh, you can go straight into creating the release. You see that it'll have a, a dummy job in there with no packages. And then um, step four we're now on to um, is, is deploying. But uh, at this point, yeah, sorry, this is missing. You could go on to you know, upload and then Bosch deploy that manifest. So where it says uh, bit, about midway, it says uh, manifest slash cfsummit.yaml. That is the working manifest that it generates for you. Okay. Now, core idea um, about uh, middle of beginning of last year when, when sort of the Bosch 2 Bits and pieces were starting to come together, and we, we got the new Bosch deployment project. We got the new Bosch CLI. Dimitri had this idea um, of, of what deployment projects should look like. Either you have a separate project like CF deployment, which collects a lot of releases, or you have a manifest folder which, for that one release. But the idea is that every project should have one base manifest that works, you know, ideally with no variables. Like, no, no um, required variables, internally generated variables for certificates, but the manifest should just work. And the CF deployment a project is an incredible tribute to that because it has one variable that's required. It generates something like 80 certificates and, and internal passwords and has one which is the system domain. So if CF deployment can do this, you can. 
Okay, what is the one, what is a good production deployment of a thing that works? All the operator files are just curating it, making it smaller, making it less secure, or making it more secure, perhaps. But I'd, 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 I'd like to see that the base manifest is the best possible manifest, and then the operator files are iterations of that. Right, a best default, right, yep. And, and once we get to the end, where I talk about pre-compiled, in that manifest, you would put the exact references to upstream uh, uh, Bosch releases that are pre-compiled. So that someone comes along, and all they need is that manifest, and they just go, Bosch, deploy that, and it works. OK, unfortunately, you can't include references to stem cells, so you still need to manually upload, upload a stem cell. Try, hopefully, by the, you'll all be using Xenial stem cells for your projects. But other than that, it'll automatically, Bosch will automatically download uh, st uh, all the releases. All right. This process of create, upload, deploy. So you've all done this, um, where you do, the, you do the create, you do the upload, you do the, the, the uh, uh, deploy. Turns out you no longer need to. So the, the, um, when you first do the Bosch gen, the base manifest that you get, that's kind of just for you. Like when you first tell other people about your project, it's not the same manifest because it uh, has this mechanism in it, and you're going to change that to reference final releases. So by the time you share, I'm going to say that a different way. By the time you first start sharing your Bosch release with other people, that base manifest, uh, that base manifest, you will have modified to have all final releases in it. No latest nonsense. All right? I'll say that a different way. That manifest should not have version colon latest in it. That is bullshit. All right? That is all about you making you happy. That manifest should work for everyone else that's not you. OK? Full of final releases, or even better, pre-compiled final releases. All right, but right now, you've got a manifest that's got this, this cool concept in it. And the cool concept is that all you do is deploy it. And this is you, as a developer, building your fast boss release. It'll automatically create, upload, uh, and, and deploy the dev release. You can just run that over and over again. It will always create a new dev release, always upload it, and always deploy it. And the mechanism is this thing called uh, the version create. And you can actually have multi like you can actually have your manifest be creating multiple releases. So you can have, uh, when you do your deploy, you can say, I want to have a, a dev release of that Bosch release, that Bosch release, and that Bosch release. Which is why the URL is kind of, oh, I don't know that dot's correct. I think it's supposed to be file colon slash slash dot. I think it's supposed to be URL. Um, uh, you'll notice I've already got BPM in there for, for completeness. Um, but this is the gist of the idea that, that that's included. Later on, once you start putting final releases in there, because you care about other people, and not just yourself, um, then what's also included is this uh, create operator. So you'll start, uh, after you start shipping your own final releases, you'll start to do this locally. Bosch deploy, base manifest, and then this uh, create.yaml. And that's the correct URL there, that file, colon, slash, slash. All right, number five. So we've got a mechanism, we've got a workflow now. Bosch deploy, you can just do that over and over again. What do we do first? What I like to do first is to just get packages to work. Not worry about the configuration of anything, just let's just text that the compilation works. So that is kind of weird and awkward. Um, and I'm not going to go into the techniques of, of you know, when it fails, what to do about it. I just we will go through this idea. Um, and the, the idea, what I'm doing here, and this is kind of a flow you can do, is um, just start by making a package. Okay. Now, that package doesn't get deployed unless a job includes it. All right. So that's the only other step we need to do, is add it to our sort of dummy job. Uh, Bosch gen uh, includes a dummy job called uh, CF Summit in this one. So all we do is update the package to, to reference it. We go and do the deploy, and it will start the, the compilation of that package. That package does nothing, because we haven't told it to do anything, but we've got our workflow. All right, it's all hooked up, and now we can start putting blobs and, uh, and, and the how to compile that blob. And you can just keep SSHing into this machine or stay SSHed into it. And just do ch dot, uh, cd dot, just to, because it's a symlink. This, uh, this folder path here is not literal, it's uh, just a symlink. So each time you do a new deploy, you'll need to do ch, cd dot, just to update that symlink. Um, and then just check what's in there. Did it compile correctly? Can I run things? You know, you could start whatever, however it is that you go about making things work. All right, just get it working, and then you can go on the process of creating jobs, and uh, um, this is what I do. All right, language packs, or uh, Bosch packages. Um, 
This was uh, brought out throughout, last, throughout this year, and um, there's one for Java, Go, Ruby, Python. Some of these are uh, like the Python one only has Python 2.7, doesn't have 3. anything. The Ruby one. 276. I've never heard of a semver number with attitude in it. Um, but they are there for you to help maintain. The Go one's very updated. Uh, the, perhaps the best one's the Java one, because finding versions of Java to include is kind of tedious. So you know, you've got someone else managing the updates of, of latest versions of OpenJDK. <laughs> Hopefully. He's right behind you. You'll make this happen, won't you, Marco? You've got, you've got people on this. You have no one that works for you, do you, Marco? It's like, we got it covered. You got it covered. Sweet. Um, good. Can you update the Python one? Uh, Ruby's missing 2.5. Uh, very great. But the premise is there. Um, and I'm sure you can help out. If one of these language packs is the one you want to use, and I'm sure you, know, you could beg nicely and be given access to the S3 blob and help maintain the versions for everyone. Um, but what they include isn't just the blobs but some nice wrapper scripts to uh, set up the environment variables so you can use them in your, uh, both, both inside your packages. Because say, if you're using Ruby, for example, you need to use Ruby both in your package, your app package, to do the bundle and whatever. And then you'll need to use it later on in your job to actually run your app on top of Ruby. If you use Go, then you'll just need Go in your compilation package, but won't need it later on. Java is like Ruby, you'll need it. Well, Java, you might already pre-compiled. But you know what you need for your dependencies. But these language packs have nice, a nice consistent experience for both the compile.env and the runtime.env. Uh, a little blog post I did when it came out because I thought it was cool. And um, well, it's not just cool. I use it. Um, and it's not just about the, the pre-existing ones. You can do this yourself. Like any package from any existing Bosch release, you can use this concept to vendor back in any other project. And any time there's a new version, you can just re-vendor it and update it. So it's a way of sharing, uh, which leads, I guess, to the to the the, you know, the prize that was discussed about. I guess so. It's, well, so what's the idea? It's going to be a, sh a shared, a communal place of, of packages. Yeah, a kind of private central for, for packages. So that means it's now your fault that the the, the Python one doesn't have 3.6. Is that what the award was? A new person to blame. Oh, we're just saying now. It's not your fault. Now, now that it's your fault, it's not your fault. <laughs> you suck. Um, which is, uh, sorry, I do have a slide. So we took this picture. Uh, so yeah, sorry, that thing. Um, the, if you didn't understand what that was about, it's about what I call them language packs because Bosch packages just seems a bit overloaded as a concept. Um, all right, seven. I'm not suggesting, let's be clear, I've showed this slide to people and they say, well, why would I want to make Bosch De Debian packages? I didn't tell you to do that. But we certainly have had wanted to Boshify things. So we've been Boshifying uh, Azure Service Fabric, which is like, uh, I guess, you know, came out of long. It's, it's, how, it's how basically Azure runs Service Fabric, Cosmos DB, and all the bits that you, if you ever use Azure, actually running on this thing called Service Fabric. Um, and when Kubernetes came out, the Service Fabric people got quite cranky because, like, well, we already had this thing. It's like, well, why don't you fucking open source it? So they did. But now everyone loves Kubernetes. But nonetheless, Service Fabric, super interesting. Um, and so uh, we work in Microsoft to Boshify it, and uh, it seemed silly for us to rewrite their entire build tool when they were already publishing Debian packages. And, we, and a good thing about Debian packages, it references all the dependencies. The only thing we don't know is what dependencies to include. Um, because that's actually one of the benefits of using Debian packages. If you've ever tried to Boshify something, that has like a pretty gnarly set of dependencies, and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to have to Boshify all that? Don't. That's another good reason for using the Debian packages. Because the way this works, um, what have I got here? So the, the gist, OK, sorry, there are two steps. I'll come back to the one I was about to refer to. So step number one is you can just try this out, which is there's, um, there's, a, there's a Bosch release called osconf. You might be using it implicitly for your jump boxes. If you use the, the, the jumpbox.yaml in your Bosch deployment, that's this, right? osconf for creating users. The other thing it's got in it is a pre-start script hook which basically means you can run anything. And this is how I do jump boxes now. Like, literally, uh, my jump box is OS comp for creating users, and then just a pretty gnarly uh, uh, script for installing Debian things, which means I can go into my jump box anytime I like and do app get upgrade and get the latest of things. It's a jump box. Let's not take it too seriously. Um, 
I know there are other approaches now around using Docker images. I think that's pretty cool too. So, um, but you can get this idea. Like at least install the package, and then perhaps you can move on to trying to write the job whilst you build up the courage and the mental capacity to actually boshify the package or not, right? But you can at least see how far you get uh, with that package installed. All right, so that's idea number one. Idea number two is um, missing on this button. Here we go. Idea number two is to still use Bosch packages to bundle up, right, everything. But what this does is it actually uses the comp Bosch compilation step. So you've got the stem cell you want to use, Xenial, whatever, Xenial 97, and run that app get inside that, collect all the Debian packages that you're going to need later on, and that's, that's your blob. That's your compiled package right there. Now, we'll get to the, 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 the corollary of this, which is whether or not you want your end users to do this or not. Um, it also means that if it's just inside your environment, you can do this with a, with a, a purely private Debian environment. All right? Again, you're going to think, well, man, my users can't do this. But I'd like to argue point number 10 is your users shouldn't be compiling packages. Like, what is wrong with you that you make other people sit there watching Java compile or whatever? That's not your fault. It's just a part of Bosch. But I'd like to argue that, that the, if we start with point 10, which is we're going to be sharing pre-compiled packages, that gives us a lot of flexibility to do anything we like during package compilation, because we are the only people that are going to do it. It could be purely private. It could be based on Debian packages. And that's what the, that's what the notion is here, is there's the... Um, the Redis, uh, what do we call it? The Redis server package is actually running apt-get commands, fetching a lot of Debian packages and saying, I'm just going to keep these for later. And then the job called Redis pack server package install, it's, it's, it's a sort of a no-op job. All it has is a pre-start script, which unpacks them all in order. So when we collect them all, we don't just collect them. We also figure out what order they need to be installed back in. Um, and it, and it sort of handles all that. So however big your dependency tree is, and however almost circular. Um, they are, some of them are kind of curly, curly, right? So you know, it tries to figure that out. There's a little helper command in there that it gets pulled in. Um, and if you play with it, you'll see what's inside that packaging script. It's kind of long. And uh, all you have to do is to say what top-level Debian packages. Um, and if you want more examples of, of this, just ping me, and I'll show you some of the pr private ones. Or look at the service fabric one because it's kind of pulling things in for, it pulls in Docker from the Docker Debian system, it pulls in Service Fabric from Microsoft's Debian system. So it has a good set of examples of, of getting it from your own bespoke. I, I'm not arguing you do this to pull shit in from uh, canonicals, right? That's, this is more, maybe it's a good idea, I don't know. But certainly if you've got your own uh, internal Debian. Um, all right, BPM. Am I winning or am I losing on time? Eh, we're close. Oh, six minutes, yay. Um, BPM, there was a talk given yesterday on BPM. There was a talk given at this conference a year ago for BPM. If, um, if you don't know why you want to use BPM, that means that you are so desensitized to all those, those uh, shell scripts you've been writing for five years that, um, uh, that you, know, you need help. Um, like when they first they gave this talk a year ago uh, in, at this extensions track, uh, and they introduced BPM, and they said, remember all those shell scripts? It's like, it's like yeah, I, I, I had forgotten them. Like, you just sort of ignore them. Yeah, you know, generators generate them, and then you just find the bit where you put your stuff, and you sort of mentally block out the rest of the pain. Uh, it's kind of like walking through Manhattan. It's like, you get to where you're going, and you don't really notice you did it with a million other people all at the same time. You just block them out. You know, before BPM, we just blocked it all out. But now with BPM, it's, it's a lot, lot easier just to do the thing you need to do, um, therefore a lot faster, um, and gives you a better contract. You know, you realize, oh, yes, I do need to write to disk. Oh, yes, I do need to do this. And you expose an explicit contract. Um, so, yeah, there's that. You should look at that. Um, all right, faster getting of your own Bosch. Um, you, you know, if the only Bosch you've got and one you want to do development on is your production AWS vSphere Bosch, you might notice that it's slow. It's slow to bring up VMs, et cetera. Faster to use Bosch Lite. Bosch Lite doesn't have to be just on your laptop. Okay, um, I, I'm using Buck because Buck wraps up a lot of nice things. Um, but even if you just go back to the Bosch deployment repo, you'll see there's a couple of Bosch Lite operator files in there. Add those in there, and all. Basically, you say I want to deploy to Amazon, but instead of putting the Amazon CPI on it, like, you, you know, whenever you deploy Bosch, there's two CPIs involved. There's a CPI locally to bring up the VM, and then you put in a CPI that will be used for all your deployments. 
Bosch Lite fundamentally is CPI to bring it up on v, you know, VirtualBox, right? And then we put in the Warden CPI or the Garden Run CPI to, to do the, the subsequent ones. So I take that step back, let's bring up one on Amazon and then put Warden inside that. And that's, you know, the, the, the ci2.starkandwayne.com, a lot of the Bosch release in there basically just reference, so that's running on one buck, but then it references the second buck, which is a, uh, a Bosch Lite running on Amazon. So we have that. Um, and then buck is nice also because it has little helpers for setting up access to Cred Hub and Bosch and, and whatever. So if you don't like buck, great, do it whatever way, but the idea of using Bosch Lite for your deployments makes every, every a lot faster. And finally, shared releases. So uh, I want to explain this in two parts. One is this, and then the next is the pipelines that we use, which you can borrow. Um, but the gist of it is, is this export release command. So once you've created it and compiled it, you can export it. The documentation referenced there even includes a little example of a dummy release, a dummy deployment, which doesn't deploy anything, but it does it so that you can then export it. And when you look at this, you think, that's incredible. This is great. I should CI this. And, um, and that's what we did. So there's, there's this project, which is what we use in Stark and Wayne um, to, uh, for all our Bosch releases. That's why it's pretty low hanging fruit for us to maintain Bosch releases, because we maintain a consistent pipeline for all of them. Um, and one of the things it's now doing is once we cut new releases at the, on the right-hand side, that feeds back into the uh, compile release job, which then compiles it. And then uh, the use compile releases job uh, updates that, that base manifest to inject. So ship it, we'll update the base manifest to put in like whatever the new version is and, and what is that git URL. And then three minutes later, it'll be updated again with a final release URL. Um, so all of the Bosch releases I maintain now, I assume people are using pre-compiled releases, not. Now it's unfortunate, and we have two minutes to bemoan this. Um, uh, oh, where am I going to go? So this is, uh, I finished, yeah, I finished. So, but I do want to take my two minutes to, to talk about something whilst Marco's here. Um, where are we at? And, and everyone else that's. So you might, you might have seen this. Uh, hands up if you've ever used the Git plus HTTPS knowingly and know what it does. Um, okay, it's not enough people. That's a terrible number of people. Marco, no one, no one uses it. So this is actually really valuable, but mutually exclusive with pre-compiled releases. So any, any package software, um, any package software you download and use, you have no idea what's in it. No. Right? You just, it's trust, really, just throwing it out there and trusting that if I download the Docker binary from Docker or Inc., I trust that it's the same as what's in the source code but I haven't actually seen them build it. And, and we have nothing in our profession that sort of does this audit trail of, I promise, you know, obviously if we did, it would be using blockchain of some sort, but whatever. Um, you know, there's no audit trail that says, I promise that what's running in production is entirely traceable back to source code, and I promise that that's it. Um, but we definitely don't have it in Bosch. Well, the moment you do uh, Bosch add blob, boof, we have no reference to where that blob even came from. Like you don't go add, Bosch, add blob in a URL, and then we keep store of that URL, and everyone else can say, ah, oh, that's where it came from. Nope, gone. No one even, you're like, you just trust the blob. Like, yes, you can look at the Bosch release and go, oh, I can see how we compile it, but you don't know where the blob came from. Um, so, ignoring that problem, which is not what I'm talking about, what we do offer in Bosch is a Git repo. A Git repo that tracks every time we added a final release. Much more trustworthy to be sharing a Git repo, which has that full audit history of changes, um, and let local people rebuild their Bosch releases from that Git history. And that's what this URL does. So when you deploy this the first time, what happens behind the scenes is it looks at that URL, it downloads the Git repo. The cool thing about the Git repo is it means you can use a private Git repo, because you're going to use your local Git uh, credentials. And so it br brings that Git repo down you know, behind the scenes. It figures out what the Bosch director doesn't already have, downloads those pre-compiled or those pre-built blobs and the jobs and everything, uploads them, and it's uh, a, perhaps a, a much more safer, pleasant way of doing it. Right? The downside is it doesn't support pre-compiled Bosch releases. So it's, uh, you pick one or the other. Dimitri did have the idea of, of he was aware of, of, of the mutual exclusive nature of these two things. One idea was that perhaps Final releases could include 
Uh, I've got nine seconds. I'm fucking using them. Um, uh, to, to, one idea might be that final releases could include pre-compiled assets. But anyway. Uh, so there's 10, 10 ways. Let's go back to use my zero seconds to look at them. Uh, we had these th five and those five. So thank you very much. I, I wanted to make sure we have time for questions. That's part of the pressure here. So I've been doing this for five years. I've never had questions yet. In which case, you could just keep blobbing away on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> questions, though? Oh, oh. Marco? No? Ah, I'm here. Oh. Um, I would be happy to mention that um, actually deploying Debian packages is kind of breaking um, a philosophy in Bosch, in building Bosch releases, which is being hermetic. Hermetic builds means you ship with all what you need to create the final results. Uh, yep. Within the Bosch release, I'm aware of that. I and gave that up. Your Bosch Gen, Bosch Gen dash dash APT is is here to bring back this hermetic build to to ship all the. All right, no, all right. So packages. one of the one of the arguments against the Debian packages is, oh, but what about CentOS stem cells? Hands up, who's ever deployed anything to the CentOS stem cell? All right, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you should all be moving to Xenial um, uh, anyway. So, uh, and they've now started to cut. You know, final releases that kind of have a three-month lifespan, 97 and whatever the next one is. Looking at Marco, he's giving me nothing. Um, so, yeah. More? More questions? Well, sorry, there'll be another one every three months, but the 97 will be maintained for some period of time because it feeds into, you know, get a year, I guess, is a good number because you've got it for pivotals. We're currently working out some kind of long-term support policy. Okay. Yeah, no, that's... The, the downside of the pre-compiled thing is you are coupling to a major version of a broader stem cell. So Ubuntu, Xenial, 97 dot anything. So for everybody, the gentleman speaking here with the nice beard, is Marco <laughs> from SAP, who is the new P, uh, PMC? PMC lead for Bosch. Which so. we have not yet figured out what that means. Well, that means you can, you can twist his arm to do things. That's right. Marco, do you do this? No, I don't do that. I'll come back later. So, uh, There's also Danny. Danny does important things. Uh, so he should, you know. He writes good. Really good code, I know. <laughs> so I, I have to admit that I didn't write Bosch releases in quite a while now, but I think basic things didn't change during the last year or so. Five years, yep. Um, so what I was always missing was uh, convenient things that you, for example, get in tools like Chef or Ansible, and you often have to come up with stuff like item potency on your own in, in shell scripts and stuff like that. So I always thought, why don't you integrate something like Ansible, for example? Well, that, that's all right. My argument, I did a talk five years ago about Bosch versus Chef. I, I wasn't in the community back then. Yeah, so. Well, it's on the internet. Um, it's, it's not versus, you know? But it's I, not I, versus. Yeah. It's just I don't, unfortunately, why, I've given you no time to have that conversation. Why, can. why can't you, or why is it not more convenient to write that? Because It's that's incredibly also, convenient. No, no, it's, 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 it's tragically item potent. Uh, what do you, we and came what, up with the idea like? to provide Bosch as a service to, to service providers on our platform. Yep. And to be honest, after, after two years, it's almost like, okay, we skipped that because no one comes up with a production-ready Bosch release and it's just not feasible. I'm sorry, you hiring stands <laughs> aren't hire? I, no, I, I'm happy to help. I, like, I mean, I don't mean to be smart about it. I just, I, you know what? I mean to be smart about it. I, um, that's exactly what I was doing. I, all right, it's we're like, going to have to close the show just I have because to, we... I mean, I understand the problem. Um, it's hard to get people to focus on learning new things, which is why the attraction to Kubernetes is because people seem to, be to like it, and it's hard to make people like things. It, it has so. to be common. Yeah. Um, would it be possible to add in Bosch Gen the, CI, the default CI uh, pipeline? It would be great to generate... Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, to make with, the pipelines yes. are pretty cool, yeah. and uh, they are in a different repo. So, yeah. All right, let's give him a big hand again.